everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Bridget Kerr. I'm the public programming coordinator for Elizabeth Hawes along her own lines. Uh, it was organi organized by myself and my classmates in the Fashion and Textile Studies program here at FIT. We are so excited to welcome you to our panel this evening where we will get to hear more about the incredible life and work of Elizabeth Hawes. It is my honor to introduce you to the members of our panel. This evening, our panel will be moderated by April Callahan, a fashion historian, author, and podcaster known for her work on the podcast Dressed, The History of Fashion. She works here at FIT in our special collections as the Associate Collections Manager and Curator of Manuscript Collections and Designer Archives. Joining us is Dr. Lourdes Font, who is a fashion historian and professor here at FIT, teaching in both the Fashion and Textile Studies Graduate Program and the Undergraduate History of Art Department. She has taught and lectured extensively on dress in art and has published widely on fashion history and various designers. Rounding out our conversation is Dr. Francesca Granada, who is Associate Professor, Professor of Fashion Studies at Parsons School of Design at the New School. Francesca founded and edits the journal Fashion Projects. She has published extensively on 20th century and contemporary fashion and greater visual culture and lectured all over the world. At this moment, I would like to ask you all to please take a moment to silence your devices, turn things off. After the panel concludes, we will have a chance for questions. You, could have, you should have received a note card as you are coming in if you were inclined to ask a question. And we will be running around to collect those and communicate them to the panelists. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening, and I hope you enjoy our panel discussion. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight here in Katie Murphy. Um, I see lots of familiar faces in the audience. Hi, guys. Um, first of all, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the graduate students of the Fashion and Textile Studies program who organized this brilliant exhibition that we are here to discuss this evening. It is beautifully done. And if you haven't had the chance already, please, please, please go see it. Um, I'm also very delighted to be here tonight with uh, Professor Font and Professor Granada. Thank you both so much for joining me in our discussion this evening of the life and career of Elizabeth Hawes. Um, Elizabeth is very near and dear to my heart. Um, in my humble opinion, I think that she's one of the most visionary figures in the history of 20th century fashion. And one of the very first words when I think about her that always comes to my mind is the word iconoclast. Um, Elizabeth, or Lizzie, as she was known to her friends and her family, um, <clears throat> wore many hats throughout her life. She was, of course, a fashion designer, which we all now know. She was also an author, published many times over. She was a labor organizer. She was a social critic and an activist. And within each of these roles, Haas really had the perception to see where and whom the system had failed. And she also had the sort of presence of mind and the prescience to attempt to affect change. And I think that is something that is so supremely special about her um, in the context of her being a fashion designer. And many of her ideas were decades ahead of their time. Um, therefore, they were considered incendiary by her critics at certain points, but also the seedlings of a long overdue revolution by her fans. So um, to kind of start us off, I think I would like to quickly summarize my connection to Haas's work and then also invite Lourdes and Francesca um, to do the same, if that's okay. Uh, Lourdes and I have kind of come full circle this evening because it's actually from you that I learned about Haas um, many years ago in the 2000s in your history of 20th century fashion class. Um, and so my, my fascination with um, Elizabeth started then. And I set myself off on a little bit of a mission to read all of her nine books, uh, which I have now done. And then cut to my professional capacity here at FIT. Um, I'm the curator of print collections, therefore in charge of our holdings 
of all of her books, uh, which are featured in the exhibition. But most importantly, also we have a supremely precious collection of her unpublished writings, which are from the last three or four years of her life. Um, so, um, and a little bit more on the personal tip, um, in my own research and writing on Hawes, I've also become sort of long distance pen pals with her son, Gavrik Losey, who uh, resides in East Sussex in the UK. And he sends a little note to the grad students this evening via email. Um, he would like to let you all know, I was delighted to hear Lizzie seems to be coming more into her own. I would love to hear the Lizzie presentation when it's done. I think you are to be congratulated for the rebirth of Hawes. I hope it goes really well. Stay well, Gatfrick. So. <laughs> um, Lourdes Francesca, I would uh, love it if you would share a little bit about your own discovery of Hawes, or maybe your interest in her work, or any work on her that you have done. So briefly, it was through a writing that I discovered Haas, and then, um, so Fashion is Spinach, primarily a book, and then as I was um, researching an ontology on fashion criticism, she kept coming up, right? Not only as herself a fashion critic, um, I can talk a little bit more later, but she was written about um, by all sorts of different critics all across the country. Um, so she was up until really the 60s, um, and how innovative her work was, but there was also some criticism of her books. So it's, she was such a central part of American fashion, and yet, um, I guess, I don't think she, she has gotten her due. Obviously, this exhibition goes a long way to do that, considering how important she was. Absolutely, she was wearing many hats exactly. all the time. For me as well, it was her writing. It was Fashion and Spinach, which I read for the first time when I was a graduate student. And then years later, when I began teaching, I assigned it as assigned reading in uh, 20th century fashion history courses. And as students discovered her, the same thing happened to them as it happened to me. They became very, um, very much aware of how precious her voice is because she tells us things that no one else does and answers questions that we have in our minds in, in a very direct way. And uh, they all became fans of hers. Um, and then the other thing was through teaching, constantly trying to complete the picture of 20th century fashion and seeking out more and more particularly American designers. And so seeking out her work, trying to find as many examples um, that survive in various museum collections. So I feel like I've been constantly sort of in touch uh, with her uh, for, for decades. Yeah. I would say like once you become familiar with her writing, it's really hard to not fall in love with her a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Lourdes, I'd like to actually direct the next question to you. Could you tell us a little bit about Elizabeth's early years and also her education? Sure. She was born in Ridgewood, New Jersey, and she grew up in a family with uh, three siblings. She was the second child, and uh, she describes uh, her upbringing as being very uh, average and middle class, her father was the manager of a shipping company in New York. Um, the family did have uh, some luxuries because her grandfather on her mother's side had been the vice president of a railroad and her grandparents could afford to travel to Europe once a year and she grew up as a child getting a Paris dress once a year and that was uh, fundamental I think for her. And then uh, she also grew up as a born fashion designer because by the time she was 10, she was dressing her dolls and soon making clothes for herself. And the family did have custom made clothes because her mother would um, sketch things that she saw in the windows of department stores and in, um, in fashion magazines and then once uh, a year or so, a dressmaker would come with sketches and patterns to make the family's clothes. And Elizabeth, by the time she was 12, was making her own clothes. And 
also selling clothes for, you know, that she made for other girls her age through a store in Pennsylvania. So she was already pretty accomplished um, as, a, uh, as a maker. And she seemed to be already set as having this, um, this goal of a career in fashion design for herself. So when she graduated high school, she wrote that she made a few you know, vague um, assertions about wanting to go to art school, but she ended up going to Vassar because her mother had gone to Vassar and so she was kind of steered in that direction. And Vassar at the time was a women's college and it was one of the seven sisters and so there were you know, social uh, connections to be made there, which she did make and which helped her later in her career. Um, she majored in economics. She continued to make clothes. And during her summers in between um, her years at Vassar, uh, one year she took a summer course at a school of design. And she said that that experience taught her that no school of design, no art school was ever going to teach her how to design clothes. So then the following summer, she got an unpaid apprenticeship working at Bergdorf Goodman in, you have to imagine her working up under that roof somewhere because she uh, was an apprentice in the couture workroom where the a couture salon uh, garments that were bought in Paris, Paris originals that were being copied legitimately for Bergdorf's customers. And that's where they were made. And uh, she said that she worked from 8.30 in the morning until 7.30 at night. Well, she got home at 7.30 at night and she said she was so exhausted that she cried every <laughs> night. Um, and, but that experience taught her um, improved skills, and knowing how uh, couture level copies were made, but she still wasn't getting any design training. Mm -hmm. And so then for final year at um, Vassar, she concentrated on preparing herself to go to Paris, to the, the source where, you know, all this, as she said, all the newspapers, all the magazines, everyone, said that fashion design uh, came from Paris. And so she brushed up her French and she saved her money, again, making extra money by selling dresses and other garments that she designed. And she got ready to go. Mm -hmm. And she writes about it um, very specifically, this idea that all fashion or the best fashion comes only from Paris. And she kind of gives it this nickname of the French legend, that, that the best fashion is made in Paris and that all women want it, regardless if they're French, American, Argentinian, um, so on and so forth. So, it, you know, that this idea kind of was planted in her mind as a child reading her mother's fashion magazines and then cemented in, in her mind even further working for Bergdorf Goodman. But I think it's kind of important at this juncture to kind of define the relationship between American fashion and French fashion a little bit further? Would you, would one or both of you maybe kind of speak to this culture of copying that you briefly alluded to, Lourdes? Francesca, do you want to pop in here? <laughs> I mean, there was obviously a kind of supremacy of French fashion at the time. Right. I mean, it was undisputed, mm -hmm. I think. Um, but even so, as early as we're talking about 20, but as early as the 30s, you start reading um, a kind of pushback. And especially I was reading The New Yorker, and Lois Long makes, not makes fun, but like kind of criticizes fashion designers. She's quite irreverent. I mean, that's why probably she got um, Elizabeth Hose to write for The New Yorker. And she kind of says, oh, well, we need um, better custom made clothing because I don't want to have to spend all this time fitting. I mean, she did up the money for the... I mean, we need more ready-to-wear clothing. I don't want to have to spend all this time for fitting. She had the money for custom make, but I feel like I'm an independent, I'm a busy woman, I'm a working woman. I don't have that kind of time for all this fitting. So I think, I wonder, I mean, there was always some sort of pull and push, but there was definitely a supremacy to French fashion. Yeah, for very deep historical reasons, Paris was the design headquarters for the international fashion industry. And there were certain advantages to that. It was very organized. 
so that um, hundreds of thousands of buyers and uh, manufacturers, representatives would descend on Paris several times a year. And that's where they received their design direction. And many of them would retain sort of permanent buying offices in the city. And Elizabeth Haas, once she sort of joined this world of Paris fashion, would find employment in these various um, structures that existed. Um, but as Francesca said, she, um, within a few years, she began to see the rot behind these sort of glamorous silken curtains. And um, she, she had a difficult time with it in, in the end. Yeah, she had a variety of jobs. She's always kind of on the hustle while she was in Paris. What exactly was she up to and how was she supporting herself? Well, I counted eight jobs in three years. <laughs> <laughs> and she arrived in the summer of 1925 already with a job that she had lined up where she was supplying fashion news to a department store in wilkes Bauer, Pennsylvania. And, but that paid her just you know, a very uh, small amount. And so she quickly got a job that first summer that she arrived uh, through a um, connection that, because she had gone with a friend and the friend's mother. And the friend was going to get her trousseau in Paris. So that sort of represents the path not taken by Elizabeth. Elizabeth was pursuing a career in fashion design. And her friend was maybe like more typical of a Vassar, recent Vassar girl. She was going to get married and just have a more conventional, more private life. Um, so through the, some connections that the friend's mother had, she got a job at what she thought was a couture house. And it was a couture house, but it, it wasn't a couture house that produced its own original designs. It was what she calls a copy house. And it was specializing in copying other couturiers' work. And she quickly learned how they got their hands on these Paris originals, sometimes intercepting them on the way to the ship that was going to take them to America, for example. And her role, since she was an American, was to act as a salesperson to the American customers who came to buy copies. Um, and she lasted there for a few months. Then she got a more lucrative job um, working as a sketcher for a uh, manufacturer who would come to town to see the Paris collections and she would be accompanying him as, as if she were an assistant, um, another, um, like a junior buyer. But what she was really there to do was to memorize as many garments as possible so that she could sketch them very quickly afterwards because the manufacturer only wanted to buy the bare minimum. He, um, as, as, as Elizabeth Hawes said herself, when you came to Paris you know, as a manufacturer, uh, as a buyer from a store or a manufacturer, you bought what you had to and you stole what you could. <laughs> so she was there to steal as many um, designs as possible. And she found that to be, um, in her words, degrading. She, she thought that it was, well, she, she said when she took the job, um, she had such a great desire to get into all of the couture salons and to see what all the couture designers were doing that she didn't give the ethics of the matter a second thought. But after a few months, it just became something that um, she didn't feel comfortable doing. She did a few seasons as this, this sketcher. She did get thrown out of one couture house eventually. Um, so then she came back to the US just to line up a few more jobs. That's when she got the New Yorker job writing about. Um, so Francesca, maybe you want to talk more sure. about that. Yeah, so basically she became the reporter, so to speak, for the New Yorker on the Paris fashion. The New Yorker was one of the first publications to have a fashion critic since it's very starting in 1925. So Lois Long, which I mentioned before, was its first fashion critic. Like Elizabeth Hawes, she had gone to Vassar. Um, she was a Vassar graduate. She was a little bit older than her, than Elizabeth. And she was also this independent woman um, 
she was like the ultimate flapper. She started out covering nightlife, so it made sense that she, and writing in the New Yorker was obviously a humorous race, started out as a humor magazine. Uh, it made sense that she would want somebody like Elizabeth Hawes to be the Paris correspondent, and the air um, nom de plume was parasite. Um, I'm not sure if you meant a, fas a parasite in the fashion system, um, hard to tell, but, and she was very, she wrote this great chapter in Fashion is Spinach um, titled News, 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 which is really quite like, a, the entire book is pretty much an ethnography, but like it's an ethnography of fashion, being a fashion critic in Paris um, in the mid to late 1920s. Um, and she's very honest. Again, she really looks at fashion criticism as she does the fashion industry through a lens of ethics. So she's like, I loved writing for The New Yorker because it was very unusual insofar that you could, uh, they never complained if you um, wrote something negative about a designer. Um, and she has this, you know, great, I don't know, imaginistic writing style. She said the advertising department never uh, reared its ugly head. Um, so, and you could write with no embroidery, whereas she was also then, she had another job writing for a syndicate. Um, so, and in that case, she couldn't really write negative criticism, which was much more common of fashion criticism at the time. And she called what she was writing at something like as a concentrated hyperbole. So I think it's, <laughs> she really had this approach that was incredibly insightful, but also quite ethical to the fashion industry and fashion press. It's fascinating because throughout her career, even just right after graduating, she was always interweaving the writing with the fashion design. Um, and, and coming into Paris, ultimately her goal was to receive training, um, which she did. Um, she completed, right before she left Paris, um, I think it was like a six month internship or so uh, with Nicole Groot. And um, we see some of Nicole Groot uh, designs back here, who was, as some of you know, Paul Paré's sister. So um, after her three years in Paris, Elizabeth returns to New York and with one of her former uh, Vassar classmates, Rosemary Hardin, she opens a custom salon, um, which was called ha Haas Hardin um, on West 56th Street. So uh, could you guys tell us a little bit about the concept behind their business, the design ethos of Haas Hardin, and also a little bit about their clientele? Sure, uh, Rosemary Hardin, who was her uh, partner in Haas Hardin, was um, also a designer for the house. And um, so they shared design responsibilities and um, Elizabeth described the, the, the business as a kind of pocket edition of a Paris couture house. Um, there were just a few rooms off of, um, I think it was just west of 56th Street was her, their first premises. And so they had a showroom, um, they had a fitting room, and they had a workroom, and that was it. Um, they employed two models uh, who also did double duty, you know, doing other tasks. And they had um, the, the vocabulary that was used in New York for their various jobs uh, at a couture house was a little different. Um, they, um, they employed what Elizabeth called drapers, um, who were really pattern makers. Um, and then the finishers were the seamstresses. That would have been called the petite main, you know, sort of in the French system. Um, so they had a few workers, but they did all the sales themselves. They didn't have a sales force. Um, but they did have some principles, some sort of guiding principles. And the first was, that everything they sold would be designed by them. In other words, no Paris copies at Haas Harden. And that they, everything that they made would be of good material, that it would be well made and well fit. And she admitted that it took years, really, for them to be able to consistently meet those standards because it was quite difficult to, um, to get um, experienced fitters and uh, just to, she had really only had a couple of seasons, maybe a single season at Nicole Grew. Um, and so she had, she had 
it took her a while to be able to consistently deliver the high quality that she wanted to, to offer her clients. And then, of course, their timing was not too great because they opened at the very end of 1928. And so they uh, were just in time for the Depression at the end of 1929. Um, and so that was what really what ended the partnership is that Rosemary Harden, um, you know, in, in the changed circumstances, it, it had been her father who was the principal financial backer. Um, decided to um, to do something else to to, to um, end her affiliation with the business. So by the time you see this dress that um, was designed for Catherine Hepburn, um, she was on her own as Hawes Inc. And um, her clientele consisted of um, socialites that were sort of connected through the world of Vassar College alumni and uh, people in that sort of New York high society. Um, and then there were a fair number of actresses like Lynn Fontaine, um, Catherine Hepburn, Helen Hayes. They were her uh, clients, mostly for clothes that she made for them off stage. And then there was at least one person who was a fashion insider and that was Bettina Wilson who was the future Bettina Ballard, um, a Vogue uh, fashion editor. But for the most part, she was frustrated that she didn't get, along with other American designers, she didn't get a lot of attention in the fashion press. Um, so that led her to you know, maybe uh, think of ways in which she could attract attention. Mm -hmm. Which included her writing, which began to multiply over and over and over again at this point. Um, she was contributing to many popular publications, including Life, Ladies' Home Journal, Reader's Digest, Women's Home Companion, and McCall's. There are others as well. But um, Francesca, what types of content was she contributing to these publications? Because I think that one of the most compelling things about Haas is that her subject matter was not limited to the realms of fashion and beauty as one might expect of a fashion designer at this time. Yeah, not at all. Um, I was just jumping ahead, so I was rereading some of her work for the PM Weekly, uh, which is a publication she added eventually in 1940, so the timeline is a little off, but I was really looking back at the design philosophy, I was really interested in how this idea of durability comes up in fashion. So this idea that fashion should be durable, what she's kind of talking about is really presciently how there should have been inbuilt, there should not be what we now know as inbuilt obsolescence in um, fashion design or design more generally. So there is these ideas again very much before her time, almost she's advocating for something like what we now call slow fashion um, as early as the 30s and 40s. And then we, another thing that came up when I was looking, really rereading this um, column that she had for the PM Weekly was um, very early on, she started questioning the division between men's wear and women's wear. Um, and so that, um, something that of course keeps coming up throughout our careers and we'll probably talk a little bit more about it later. Yeah, absolutely. And let's just say these ideas that she was putting forward were 75 years ago, right? Decades ahead of their time. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> in 1931, Elizabeth makes a little bit of a bold move to challenge that French legend that we were talking about earlier that um, the best clothes were made in Paris and that all women wanted them. How did she endeavor to do so, and how were her actions received at the time? Um, I think we have a photograph of her um, on, on her way back from that, um, what she called a press stunt. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. It seems to have started, it wasn't her idea, it was the idea of one of her backers, um, in one of the investors in her business, who was a woman named Eleanor Shaler, and she had the idea of, well, why don't you take your fashion designs to Paris and stage a fashion show there, and that way you'll get some press over there, and the um, um, that will kind of validate you in America, and you will, the, the American fashion press will 
uh, wake up and take notice of you. So she lent herself to this idea and went over and stayed at the Plaza Atene Hotel and rented out a very fashionable restaurant, the uh, Ambassador restaurant, where all the fashionable people um, were used to go. And it, it was her fashion show had sort of two performances, one in the afternoon, one in the evening, and it was on a carefully chosen date, July 4th. Uh, she had about 20 designs that she was showing, and she placed an ad uh, asking for American, uh, Americans in Paris to sort of service her models. And she was hoping that the people that she knew during her years in Paris would show up, and that the fashion press that was permanently encamped in Paris would show up. But she was disappointed, because although she did seem to have um, crowds in the audience that were sort of curious as to what this fashion show would be like. Um, it was held on a Saturday and people were either out of town or uh, busy working on their own collections and the sort of the, the world of the Paris Couture did not turn out to support her. Um, nor did the fashion press. Um, some of them told her, you know, directly, we're in the business of reporting Paris fashion, not American fashion in Paris. And the fact is that by showing her work there, it, it seemed to be violating the very structure of the fashion industry. That, you know, Paris fashion shows were designed to sell uh, Paris fashion to the world. And so was she trying to sell American fashion in Paris? It was the opposite and it made no sense to most people at the time. It was inconceivable. Of course, today, American designers have boutiques in Paris, just like they do around the world. But that was really kind of inconceivable at the time. So she was disappointed in that she didn't seem to have, the press stunt it did not uh, seem to have worked. But back in New York, someone tipped off the, um, the reporters that greet every transatlantic liner so that there, if there are any notable people on board, they would swarm around them and interview them and they would you know, get press coverage. So the, uh, we do have a photograph of we her do. on the ship coming back. There she is. There she is um, in July 1931. And so this is a photograph taken by the photographers for the shipping news. And so they interviewed her and it worked in the end. The following year, she started to get more, um, more coverage in the fashion press, like the photo of Katherine Hepburn that you just saw. Um, and um, she also said that she got her first ready-to-wear design deal um, in 1932. She also got, Lord and Taylor included her as in their promotion of American fashion designers, which was the, really the first time that anyone had invested in promoting American design, and that was by uh, Dorothy Schaefer, in, um, the ex uh, executive over at Lord & Taylor. So in the end, the, the, this very brave thing that she had done um, to show her fashion in Paris did pay off, even though at the time it must have been a, a, a very disappointing experience. But it did create for her in the, in the mind of the press a persona of being very plucky. And um, I think Vogue in 1933 described her as a little black haired bit of fury. <laughs> so, you know, she developed, she, she, she earned for herself this persona as someone who was, um, who was not afraid to go against the tide. Yeah, well, she definitely put some of that fury onto the page when she published uh, her best-known book, which is Fashion as Spinach, of course, in 1938. Um, it is so refreshing. I think that um, if any of you ever mention it to a friend who has also read it, it's definitely going to put a smile on your friend's face as soon as you mention it. Um, it's witty, it's candid, it's acerbic, and essentially it is a takedown of the current fashion system at large. So, um, Francesca, I'm hoping that you could speak to some of the big topics that Haas covers in Fashion as Spinach. Yeah, as I said before, fashion is pretty much the way I read it, at least. It's, it starts um, with our Paris years, 
um, and it goes on into the New York years. Uh, but it, it reads to me like this ethnography, right? She's an insider, and she's reporting on what this system is, whether it is the fashion press system or originally the copy house, and then um, the, sty the styling, um, the sketching, and in more contemporary time, uh, her own, not contemporary time, later on, her own, um, her own design house. Uh, what I find, yeah, really compelling, it's, it's written in this very humorous tone. It's like fast paced. I think it captures what must have been her personality, although, of course, I don't know because I never met her. Um, and yeah, for instance, when I assign it to students, um, they can't quite believe it's the 1930s. It's written in the 30s, right? It's, it's so contemporary. I think what's also very contemporary, it's their interest in unveiling um, what's really going on beyond the scene in fashion. And I think her, she focused quite a lot on ideas of class, right? Which is something that you don't read in um, fashion criticism, or I learned a lot of fashion writing at the time. Um, and not only does she talk about, for instance, the labor condition of the people making um, the Paris couture and how underpaid they are. Um, she also talks about who can afford uh, the really the costume clothing and how the ready-made is not really up to par. So there is very few people who can afford this um, fantastic fashion. So she's very, um, again, she's looking at fashion although in a humorous tone through an ethic dimension. I think that's what makes it also very um, contemporary. And, and one of the main topics she likes to talk about quite frequently is the intersection of dress and necessary social reform. Um, she brings this up again and again. Um, would one or both of you kind of maybe speak more broadly on this idea? And then also too, if, if we could kind of narrow that down maybe to the point of gender, which she was kind of focused on all throughout her career. Yeah, I think that she looked around and realized that somehow women's fashion had become by the 1930s in a way more modern than men's in the sense that um, the clothes of the 1930s were very lightweight. They sort of flowed with the body. They um, did not restrict the, the body's freedom of movement in any way. Whereas men uh, were still wearing, they were still sort of gripped by these tight collars and they had ties that, that, they, they, that were not optional. <laughs> Um, they, uh, when you look at old uh, newsreels of just, you know, people on the street in the 1930s and 40s, all the men are in suits and ties. And she realized that, you know, men could use some freedom of expression, but also some greater freedom of um, just having more comfort um, in their clothes, as well as some liberation from the uh, restrictions that decreed that certain colors, certain materials were not appropriate for men to wear. And because she had this very original cast of mind um, and she saw things very clearly, she was not afraid to sort of go up against these very, very long established conventions about what was masculine, what was feminine, just as more and more uh, women were finding more and more occasions to wear pants um, in the uh, course of their sort of ordinary fashionable wardrobes there were, as the 1930s went on, you had more and more pants, outfits worn for leisure, um, that, um, that things could go the other way as well, and with menswear becoming more free and more comfortable. Uh, so again, it's part of her originality, her, um, her visionary quality, that you know, she was able to um, to break down these conventions and to propose some freedom from them. Yeah, and and, and let's just say in um, in fashion and spinach, one of the things that she proposes with a title chapter is men might like skirts. So um, we might come back to that if we have enough time, because I think we're running kind of right. short on time. I just want to add that. I was reading Fashion in Spinach the other day and she had this beautiful, she set up this scene in, 
um, in that very chapter in which she goes to the New School for Social Research to listen to this um, uh, modernist architect talk about his practice and and he's like, but he couldn't quite do it because like, you know, he had the necktie that was, you know, he had this really restrictive manswear, which was not in line with his architectural practice. So I think that was quite funny. But as you said, I mean, she was, I guess, I mean, it's obvious and what she said, she was very much like a feminist. Um, and that's where also this idea of gender roles and fashion and undoing that comes from. Yeah, and, and bucking the system entirely, we find in this quote, uh, Lizzie's work is often humorous, and one of the funnier anecdotes I've run across is actually in the unpublished manuscripts that we have at, um, in special collections. Um, and she says here, I wore blue jeans for my marriage to Mr. Losey, who was her second husband. We went across the Vermont border to a small New York town because in Vermont I couldn't be married having been divorced. The Justice of the Peace then asked Mr. Losey, do you take this man to be your wife? <laughs> From the befog look on the Justice's face from the time he saw this female in blue jeans, I'm not sure he said that on purpose, but maybe, because who ever heard of a female being married in trousers in 1937? So um, this comes to kind of a turning point in Elizabeth's career because after 12 years and at the top of her game as kind of American's fashion darling, because remember she was writing in all of these popular publications, her, she was a household name. Um, and she decided to shut the door to her custom salon in 1940. So what was she doing in 1940, 1941? Why did she decide to close the business and what was she up to in the early years of uh, World War II. Well, first of all, I have to say I am really sorry that she closed in January of 1940 because I would have liked to have seen what would have happened. Um, it, it was, in a way, it was a curious timing um, because in just a few months, um, the world of Paris fashion and its connection to uh, its international markets would be broken by the occupation of Paris. And the early 1940s would be a great time for American designers because there was no one, there was no Paris fashion for the press to pay attention to. American designers were it, they would be the whole story. And it's a shame that she did not keep her business open. She had already embarked on various ready to wear projects, so she wasn't exclusively a couturier. And it would have been great to see her at work in New York, along with Mamboche and Charles James, who both came over to New York um, when the war began in, uh, in Paris in 1939, and to see her working along with Bonnie Cashin and Claire McCardell and other American uh, designers. But she closed because it made sense for her at the time. She um, uh, had made a, such a great success with fashion and spinach. It had been a bestseller. And that she began to remember how she had enjoyed writing um, and expressing herself in that way when she had worked for The New Yorker. And so she kind of felt a, a, another avocation to be a writer and a journalist and a critic. And um, even though she was, as you said, uh, very successful by this point, um, she had about 200, uh, more than 200 employees. She was in a uh, expanded location on East 67th Street, but she thought that the time was right for her to do something else. And once again, we're struck by how contemporary her voice is, because what she said is, is like something that you read today about um, maybe a, an influencer or a psychologist or someone who is advising people on de-stressing and detoxifying and uh, sort of simplifying their life. Um, she said that she felt that she had completed a designing cycle and that she was, quote, happy to rest my designing talents to watch and to wait for the next cycle of my life to shape itself, end quote. So getting off the rat race and rediscovering her, her calling, 
Uh, I, we also have to add, of course, she had, been wor she had worked very, very hard to earn the success of her business. And uh, she was also the mother of a young boy. And so she had lots of things to pull her in different directions, but she chose this moment to step back. And then the next thing that we hear is that she had designed a um, uniform for a Red Cross volunteer. Um, and she did work in an uh, airplane engine mm -hmm. factory. So once again, coming into direct contact with labor and labor practices. And so making her contribution to the war effort at the same time. Yeah. And in 1943, I believe, is when she moved to Detroit, which of course is not, I don't believe it was a fashion city even then. Um, but it's interesting because of, to just kind of try to um, encapsulate how varied her background was. Um, she has a column now for the Detroit um, Free Press, I think it's called. And so she, the Detroit Free Press introduced her, Elizabeth Holes, as a varied background, as fashion designer, author, author, aircraft worker, nursery school advocate, and now member of the education department of the EAW, so the United, United Auto Workers. So by now she's also working in the union. Um, yeah, and I don't know if I have time to talk about what she wrote in this newspaper, but yeah, she takes on issues of labors again uh, and politics uh, together with fashion. Yeah, and this is actually the subject of yet another book that she wrote um, called Hurry Up, Please, It's Time, um, which takes its title from a line in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, the poem. Um, but that particular book, which was published in 1946, basically documents her time that Francesca was just speaking of working um, as a labor organizer for women in the United Auto Workers um, Union, and it documents all sorts of rampant um, sexual exploitation and harassment in the UAW. So um, we are <clears throat> getting a little quick on time, so I'm gonna actually answer, or we can discuss this first question, which was actually my next thing that I wanted to talk about, so this is perfect. Um, the question is, in your opinion, how much did the FBI investigation affect Haas's couture business? Um, and this is actually one of my very favorite objects that's in the exhibition. It's dated July 22nd, 1941. Um, and it evidences, if you see the exhibition in this moment in Haas's life, when things take a rather McCarthyan twist, because FBI documents are not necessarily what you usually expect to see in a fashion exhibition. So um, how and why did Haas first draw the attention of the FBI? And what were some of the ripple effects of the investigation of her? Well, I have seen the, uh, the cover of the, I guess, the first page in her FBI file, which is included in the exhibition. And um, it, it seems to be groundless <laughs> for investigating her. Um, they cite information from a, an informant whose name is redacted that says only that she had, um, was considered radical um, and that she had um, put on this fashion show in Paris and that she had also taken um, a, at the invitation of the Soviet government staged a fashion show in uh, Moscow. Um, that was, I believe, in 1935. And then it doesn't really say anything else. Um, now, they didn't, the fashion show in Moscow did not provoke the opening of the FBI file because, as you say, it wasn't until July of 1941. It was a few years later. So I think that it, I mean, reading between the lines, I suspect that maybe it had to do with her union uh, activism and that um, for the FBI to consider her someone that needed to be kept tabs on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it had anything to do with the, close, the closure of her house. I think that that was her decision for her personal reasons. But then when she reopened um, and started a fashion business again in 1948, um, and within a year and a half, she closed it again. So I have to wonder, did it affect her at that point? Or did she, did she come back to the world of New York fashion maybe 
was not great timing because, of course, that was when the, the press and the entire industry was sort of gearing up to support the, the new look and this, this new era of the domination of Paris fashion. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know. I think this is all very interesting to find out whether it, in fact, affected her. It may not have affected her at all. I don't know. I mean, I would assume it has to do with their labor work and the kind of writing the socialist undertones. But yeah, I can only speculate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are definitely socialist leanings throughout her writings, but she says again and again that she is staun sta she was staunchly anti-fascist. So perhaps positive on the socialist tip, but not fascist. Um, so when the second incarnation of Haas Inc. fails, she kind of bails to the Caribbean for a little while. She writes another couple books. Um, before she, um, when she comes back to New York, she actually doesn't stay very long. She moves to California, where her ex-husband, Joe Losey, was with Gavrick. Um, Joe was working in the film industry. And it's there that she meets a fellow kindred spirit in California designer, Rudy Gernrick. Um, and this is um, another question that we have here. Haas was a champion of ready-to-wear, yet she put most of her attention to couture and handmade knitwear, like this. <laughs> what happened, is the question. Uh, so, Lourdes, what kind of clothes was Haas making in the 1950s and the 1960s? Because she's kind of now outside of the traditional fashion system. Right. She's in California making clothes for a very small circle of clients. Um, and we have the opportunity to see what she was doing in the 60s in the exhibition. Um, those pieces have really not been shown since maybe 1967 when she had the um, joint retrospective with Rudy Gernreich in, here at FIT. And so I think that um, the, the, you can see the garments for yourself they are, uh, they're 60s. <laughs> so she, she was no longer a woman of the 1920s and 30s. She was keeping pace with changing life and changing styles. And, um, but at the same time, I think that they are still modern, very, very modern clothes, just as she had been making in, um, at the start of her career. And that um, she was more interested in textures and um, the feeling of materials as opposed to maybe the look of them visually. Um, there are some sort of heavier, gutsier materials um, in the knits especially, and that was something that she and Rudy Gernock had in common is this appreciation for knitwear. And um, I think in those, um, those... You wanna go back? ...designs that you had, I can also see like echoes of Paris in the 1920s, you know, the sort of art deco of the 20s with the abstract patterns. I mean, it it's, um, reminds you of Fernand Léger and Sonia Delaunay. So I think all of this is kind of absorbed um, in all the accumulated influences on her, but they're very much of the 60s. They're radical <laughs> and I, literally eye-opening. And because she, you know, she must have really enjoyed the 60s because at, by the end of the 60s, you have the, the overturning of the, the structures of, in the fashion industry that she had um, really argued against in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So it was good that she lived long enough and that to see that change and that her designs obviously evolved along with fashion. Yeah. Well, Francesca? Oh, no, I just want to say, yes, that this idea of like skirts for men, it finally came to pass, right? I mean, I'd only seen, i never seen the later work uh, I only see it now at the Museum of FIT. It was so great to be able to see the actual work, but I remember reading this press, especially the one in the Tribune, and thinking how, together with the manuscript that you wrote about, how incredible um, this exhibition with men in skirt. Yeah, and I think that's was. one interest that both her and Gernrich shared very mm -hmm. much and similar was the dissolution of gender in clothing. 
Gernrich himself did it again and again and again. And um, I think Lourdes mentioned very briefly, but there was an, actually a retrospective exhibition of both of their works here at FIT in 1967, which is what this is press pertaining to. Um, following the uh, exhibition at FIT in 1967, Hawes actually didn't go back to California. She remained here in New York, and she took up residence at the Hotel Chelsea, which is just four blocks south of here. And that is where she wrote the unpublished manuscripts that we have here in special collections. And, oh, oops, sorry guys, what happened? Can you go back to the manuscript page? Yeah. There we go, perfect. Um, the, these unpublished manuscripts are really sort of a mishmash of sorts. Her thoughts on a variety of topics ranging from advertising and the media, gender equality, and of course fashion. Um, but the manuscripts are kind of, they feel, they, they feel unfinished, they feel chaotic, and they feel very disorganized. Uh, her, de her signature wit and candor are definitely there, um, but the disorganization is probably due to the fact that Haas herself was very deep um, in the depths of alcoholism. And uh, Haas's biographer, Bettina Birch, noted that friends had kind of noticed Elizabeth's hard drinking ways for decades, but nobody was really prepared for the fact that it would ultimately, ultimately be her demise. Um, Elizabeth left us far too young at the age of 67. She actually passed away from cirrhosis of the liver on September 6, 1971 at the Hotel Chelsea. So my very last question um, for the two of you, um, you know, personally, I've always been so curious as to what Elizabeth might have been, have accomplished had she been born a generation later, Lourdes, which you, which you touched on. The American fashion industry in the 1930s just really wasn't ready for someone like her yet. And um, she's starting to get her dues. Um, this exhibition, of course, which is incredibly important. And then Haas was also featured in the 2022 exhibition in America at the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where they dedicated an entire um, room in the period rooms just to her work. Um, but I'm curious if either of you have thoughts on why it is that she's capturing people's attention now um, and what do you feel Haas's legacy is to contemporary American fashion? I mean, to me, it's that what I mentioned before, right? She's m putting together melding fashion and activism at a time well before this became, I don't want to say commonplace, but um, something that at least American designers might do. And then she's also bringing in the lens of social justice to fashion. And now you see a lot of company are asked to do that if they don't do it already. So she has, there is that element and then the gender fluidity. I mean, she did it well before it became even a term. Um, and then the third thing, it's even this idea of durability and the idea that fashion shouldn't go so fast, even though it wasn't nearly as fast as it is now. I mean, and that you should be able to keep a, a suit um, for four seasons or four years rather than like changing the other season. So that's another element that we talk about a lot um, in fashion um, right now. So, I mean, it's somewhat incredible if you think about it that she was doing all that so early on. Mm -hmm. Lourdes? Yeah, I think her legacy is really is in her nine books that everyone should read. Um, and that I love that the exhibition begins with those nine books. Um, and so I think that that's really the best way to honor her is to read her books and hear her voice and understand just how far ahead she was of her own time. And it would have been wonderful if she'd lived another 30 years. Um, I think she would have appreciated that these issues um, are, are at the forefront of discourse about fashion now. Um, I think that back in 1937, she's the only person who is saying this, which is something that we hear a lot today. She said, 95% of the business of fashion is a useless waste of time and energy. <laughs> no one else was saying that in print in 1937. 
And we're all talking now about how damaging this industry is and does anyone really need it? And, and the, the curious thing about her that I think that we can all um, appreciate now is that she was someone who started out from childhood as someone who loved fashion. And she recognized that, that it was an artistic form of self-expression and that it was valuable. And yet, that this was the truth about the when fashion becomes an industry, it it becomes something. And she does use the word evil. Mm -hmm. So the the task was to reconcile this, to to create fashion that encouraged the self expression, the artistry, but that did no harm, right? And that's what we're we're struggling towards today. So she really is, is a pioneer and a visionary, as you said at the beginning, April. And just at a really short note, I was um, the, w, the WWD review of fashion spinach uh, concludes by saying that she has a destructive attitude towards the fashion system. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and just one last note on that same tip, answering this question. Um, I think the meaning of fashion as spinach has been kind of lost to us today, but essentially um, her audience at the time would have understood what she meant is fashion is nonsense or fashion is a bunch of BS. So um, that's Lizzie in, 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 a, in, in a capsule right there, pretty much. So we are out of time tonight. I'm sorry that I didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, if you do want to come and talk to us about your specific questions, I think we can hang, up, hang out up here for just a few more minutes. Um, but we would um, love to chat with you if I didn't get to your question. So thank you all so much for coming this evening. Congratulations to the graduate students on your beautiful exhibition. And we hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more tonight about Elizabeth Haas. Thank you, April. Thank you, April.